Okay, today I wanted to offer a quick proof of uh, Kramer's rule, give you the idea of what's going on. The book has a proof, but uh, I don't think it's going to be as clear. I don't think it is clear as what I'm going to do here. Okay, let's talk about uh, the proof of Kramer's rule here. Okay, first thing I'm going to discuss here is properties of determinants. You should already know. I'm going to assume that uh, cap A here is an n by n determinant with uh, either real or complex coefficients, okay? And C is a scalar, just a number that's an element of the complex numbers or the real numbers, respectively. Okay, you remember uh, some of my notation that I used in a previous video. Uh, DET of A, determinant of A, is going to be the determinant of row 1, row 2, down to row N, all right? So we think of these as the N rows of the determinant A, or the matrix A, okay? And now, let's talk about this first elementary row operation. We're just recalling the uh, properties of uh, determinants with respect to elementary row operations here. If I've got uh, any one of the rows and I multiply that row by the scalar K, okay, leaving the rest of the matrix unchanged, then what happens if I take the determinant of that n by n uh, matrix, I can actually do what? I can actually take the k out, and it turns out to be k times the determinant of the original matrix A. Okay, you should have known that from your readings here. And then uh, uh, here, if I have uh, just two rows of the matrix, and I decide to interchange those two rows, remember that's another elementary row operation, what does that do to the determinant? Well, it changes its sign, okay? It's otherwise the same value except for a signature change, okay? This is uh, the property that we were calling alternating, ultimately, or at least that's the origin of the name. Okay, and then one last row operation, which is fundamental here, right? Uh, elementary row operations. Uh, if I take, what, a multiple of one row and add it to another row, what, how does that change the determinant here? See, what I did was take the uh, uh, jth row and add the scalar multiple k to the ith row here. See, it's otherwise unchanged. It's only changed the ith row here. Uh, you just get exactly the same determinant, right? Okay, so its uh, determinants are unchanged under that particular elementary row operation here. And now from your readings here, you should have also noticed that the determinant of the transpo transpose of a matrix is what? The same as the determinant of that matrix. Of course, that's a square matrix. Okay? Otherwise, it wouldn't be de defined at all. Okay? Uh, basically, the determinant's not going to be able to distinguish between row and col rows and columns. I could have C1, C2, down to Cn here, and actually have all the same properties where the Cs here stand for columns instead of rows. Okay? And one last property here. It's actually not going to come into play in this, but we're throwing it in for the sake of completeness. If B is another n by n uh, matrix, then the determinant of the product of A and B is the product of the determinant. So that's a wonderful property, isn't it? Uh, therefore, what uh, that would also be the de determinant of B times A. So that notice, even though A and B may A times B may be different than B times A, right? Because uh, matrix multiplication is not generally commutative, the determinants will still be the same. Interesting. Okay? All right. All right, but this is the property I really want to focus on right now, okay, for Kramer's rule. Okay, because of that property for basically dealing with the transpose of the matrix instead of the matrix, uh, the properties 1, 2, and 3 apply to elementary co column operations also. Okay, so instead, if I multiply a column of the matrix by a scalar, I can bring that scalar outside the determinant. Okay, uh, if I add, uh, if I interchange two columns of a matrix and then find the determinant, that would be what the negative of the determinant of the original matrix, or if I add a multiple of one column to another column within the, the matrix, that will leave the determinant unchanged, okay? So I'm just saying all these operations uh, apply to columns instead of just rows, okay? So that's kind of nice. We haven't dealt with uh, column operations very much here, but uh, we're going to right now. Let's take a quick peek on this. 
Let me show you how Kramer's rule works then. I'm talking about proving Kramer's rule. I'm basically going to be proving it by an example because you'll be able to uh, extend this idea in your minds very easily here. So I'm going to take this particular system of three linear equations and three unknowns, the unknowns being x1, x2, x3, and c1, c2, c3 are some constants. And the rest of these, you can see, are coefficients here on the various x values. OK, so this is the way I'm going to write it here. Notice that we could also write this as a matrix equation, where I've got this 3 by 3 matrix here being multiplied by this column vector equaling what that column vector here. This would be the column of unknowns. This would be the column of constants. OK, and this is what we were calling the coefficient matrix. I will call that uh, A, OK, since uh, I had uh, little a's there, I will call that thing uh, cap A. So I'm assuming those are either real or complex 3 by 3 determinants, OK, or matrices, matrix. Alrighty, so that's our system here. So we want to look at this. Now, let's uh, think about some things here. I just want you to consider something real fast, OK? Now, I've got vertical bars here indicating that I'm taking a determinant, right? OK, so this is a determinant of what the uh, coefficient matrix almost. But do you notice down this first column, I have what? x1 factors. Now, think about that just for a second here. Now, I left a little open gap here because I'm going to write something here. Notice that I've actually taken what? The first column of my coefficient matrix and multiplied it by a scalar, the scalar x1, in fact. Now, uh, my properties of determinants tells me I can actually factor out that x sub 1. So right here where I've got equals, I'm going to write x sub 1 times the determinant of a. OK, so these two should be equal. Now, I've also got another equal sign written off of this one here. Did you guys see what I did? How did I got from this matrix to this matrix? Think what's, in, think what's inside the vertical bars here. I actually did this. Um, I took x2 times the second column and added it to the first column. OK, and I also did what? Added x3 times the third column and added it to that result. OK, so I actually did what? A couple of those operations. But what should be true? The determinant should be unchanged by that operation, right? So I have a valid equal sign here. OK, so x2 times this column added to that. And what? x3 times the third column added to that also. OK, so that's what I've got written here. Now, you should recognize this thing. What is that? Well, wait a minute. Isn't that, what, the left-hand side of my system of equations? Right, that's the left-hand side of my system of equations. Now, what are those values supposed to be equal to? Why, they're supposed to equal C1, C2, C3. And notice these are unchanged. I've only been monkeying with the first column. OK. Now, the important thing is what? The first and the last. These two are equal, right? These two. OK. So what is my x sub 1? Well, I can isolate my x sub 1 by going like this. I take this guy and divide it by the determinant of a. OK, now I can divide by the determinant of a whenever what? a is invertible. Because remember, a matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero. OK, and then I have the determinant of a here. OK, I'm deciding to write it this way. So, oops. And there we go. We've actually solved for x1. Again, this is under the assumption that this determinant in the denominator is non-zero here. OK? Otherwise, there might be infinitely many solutions or no solution at all. OK, so Kramer's rule only works when our coefficient matrix is invertible. In other words, when this determinant is non-zero. Okay?
So there it is. That's how you get x1. But notice what did I do? I can imagine taking this uh, determinant here and replacing what? The first row, what did I do? Replace the first row, which was the coefficients for the x sub 1, and replace them by the c's, right? By the constant vector. Okay, that's what I did here. Now, can you extrapolate? Can you conceive what we would do to get x sub 2 and x sub 3? All right. What would x sub 2 be? Well, you'd do the same type of thing, only you'd be doing what? You'd be replacing the second row by the c's. You could do exactly the same argument I did here. And you would end up proving or obtaining this. Okay. And here's, all right, that's the determinant. There's a down there. Okay. And likewise with x sub 3. Okay. There you would replace what? The third column and leave the other two alone. Okay? Alrighty? So there's Kramer's rule. That's how it works, and that's why it works. It comes directly from the properties of determinants. It's actually pretty easy, and you can see, obviously, how you could extend this to what? N, equa li N linear equations and N unknowns. Okay? It works exactly the same way. That's the essence of why Kramer's rule works. So there you go.